So, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this online immunometabolism seminars. It's already the fourth time now. Today we have Annie Curtis presenting. Annie did her uh, PhD in the lab of Garrett Fitzgerald at UPenn, where she was working on the clock in the context of uh, cardiovascular function. After that, she spent a while outside of academia and she was a researcher at GSK, for example. Then in 2011, she came back into academia, thanks to Luke O'Neill, who was our first presenter here. In 2014, Annie obtained a starting investigator research grant from the uh, Science Foundation Ireland, and that allowed her to start her own uh, research group and obtaining other uh, prestigious grants. She uh, established a now successful uh, the Curtis Clock Lab. So you can also find her uh, on Twitter. She has a very nice website, so I would suggest to, to visit it. Uh, today, uh, Annie will be talking about time, obviously, and how it relates to inna innate Im uh, immunity uh, and metabolism. So Annie, you can um, take your microphone and go ahead. I'm looking forward to this. Oh, yeah. and by the way, the questions can be raised via the chat box. Good. So thank you, Annie, for your time. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Jan, and um, thanks everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to be able to do this. And I think one of the um, good things that have come, has come from COVID and the lockdown is all of these great webinars that allow, you know, everyone, no matter their financial position, you know, you don't have to go to conferences. We can hear great science. I think science has opened up um, in the community and I think that is one good thing to come from, from COVID. So as Jan said, um, we're really interested in, in time and, uh, oops, oh, hold on, sorry now. So we're interested in time and, you know, humans have been, I suppose, obsessed by time of day for the longest time. You know, back in Roman times, we used to wear a sundial around our neck, not the most fashion conscious, um, piece there to tell time of day. We've had bands who have named their albums clocks, but and in Ireland for sure, you know, we even have clocks to uh, tell the time to go for a pint. But the clock that I'm going to talk to you about today is our body clock, and it is essentially our internal timekeeping mechanism that allows us to track um, our daily cycle. So we live on a spinning planet, there's no denying that. And because of that, there are very uh, predictable times of light and dark. And pretty much every organism on the um, planet has some sort of timing capacity to allow it to align the most appropriate uh, behaviors and physiology to either the light or the dark cycle. So one thing to remember is that light is uh, the dominant synchronizer of our body clocks. And, and how that happens is there's um, specialized cells in the back of the eye which receive um, the light signal. And they signal to an area in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That is our master clock. Um, and that uh, uh, predicts many of the rhythms that we observe in say hormonal functions such as like melatonin or cortisol. But what we've learned over the last maybe 20 years is that you know outside of the SEN, which is certainly our master clock, um, outside of the SEN, pretty much every other cell in our body also has this ability to tell time of day. Now it's certainly getting a lot of direction from the SEN clock, but it itself is able to um, have its own timing mechanism and be entrained by certain external uh, stimuli as well. Now, what we've learned as well is that immune cells are, are, are not uh, spared from this. They also have a robust molecular clock. And certainly the cells that I'm gonna be talking about today, the macrophages and dendritic cells, they have a ro robust clock. And that's what we're really interested in. So let's just uh, talk a little bit about what uh, makes a circadian rhythm. So we, have to, we have to think about circadian rhythms. I just think about them like cosine waves, which you would have remembered from your maybe physics classes. And what we see for something to be circadian, it essentially has to peak and trough within 24 hours. 
Remarkably, what we now know is that up to 80% of protein coding genes are cycling somewhere in the body, which is a remarkable level of control. And I would say that this makes the circadian system probably the largest regulatory network that we know in normal physiology. So what does the body clock do? Well, the body clock ensures correct time alignment of a number of behaviors. So what the body clock is doing is it's trying to align to the light dark cycle and make sure that behaviors such as activity and rest and feeding and fasting are aligned appropriately to that light dark cycle. But we have to think now that in a very short space of time, certainly from an evolutionary uh, time scale, we have very much changed our behavior. So, you know, back in these days, um, our activity and our behaviors were very much predicated by the light dark cycle. We rose with the sun and we set with the sun. But in the last, say, 100 years, you know, we have really moved to um, a lifestyle which is, which is very much divorced from the external light dark cycle. And what we now know from both epidemiology and animal studies is that modern life is actually disrupting our body clocks. The reason for that is we spend nearly 90% of our time indoors in very low lighting. We're not getting that strong external um, light stimulus that our forefathers would have during the day. Tell me who doesn't check their phone uh, before they go to bed at night, especially in these days when we're all on uh, in Twitter dark holes. Um, so we're exposing ourselves to light when we're not supposed to be exposing ourselves to light. And as well as that, with technology like fridges, we can eat at any time of the day. So again, our, there's misalignment between the light dark cycle, our activities and you know, our feeding and fasting just due to modern lifestyle. What that's all causing though is um, a number of diseases. And what we can see now is that circadian rhythm disruption is leading to a number of conditions in childhood, even more than in midlife. And then as we age, we're seeing a, very high, a high correlation between circadian rhythm disruption and a number of these conditions, which we can all, I think, appreciate are uh, chronic inflammatory dis um, diseases. And that's what got us really interested, was this connection between circadian disruption and chronic inflammatory diseases, just because of the underlying importance of the immune system in these conditions. So I looked at uh, Luke's talk from a couple of weeks ago, and I've stole this from Luke's talk, but you know, he stole it from Nav Shandell, so I don't feel too bad. Luke was talking about the fact that um, genetic variants you know, do not cause, do not explain the increased incidence in diseases because you know, our genes have not changed that quickly, but what's changed is our diet, environment, and behavior. And what Luke is saying is like really metabolism is that sensor of these uh, environmental changes. And gene expression is just the passenger. So metabolism is the driver and gene expression is the passenger here. And he's probably right. And, but what I would say is that really probably the biggest sensor that really links us to our external environment is our body clock. So, you know, what we talk about environment, behavior and diet, well, they are the three main things that our body clock is ensuring alignment of together. So when we look at our immune system, and this is studies that have been done probably mainly in the last, um, I would say, 10 years. What I'm just to orient you to the slide. So us uh, chronobiologists were a bit quirky and we like to uh, call time by this thing called Z-Cuber time or uh, ZT. And how we do it is we talk about ZT0 is the time and lights will go on in the animal facility and then ZT12 when, when the lights will uh, go off. And that determines the animal's um, activity patterns because mice are nocturnal. They rest during this um, light period and they become active then when the lights go out. If anyone's gone into the mouse house after lights go out, you'll know that there is a ferocious noise of the animals moving around. What we see though is that our immune system is highly rhythmic. And essentially what we can kind of partition is that there's a time of day when there's reduced cytokine induction, there's reduced bacterial viral clearance, and there's reduced LPS lethality. And that really corresponds to when the animal is transitioning into their rest phase. 
On the other side of it, though, then we can see a time of day when our immune system is very much ramped up. You know, it's highly sensitive. And we see enhanced cytokine induction, enhanced bacterial and viral clearance, but then unfortunately enhanced, say, LPS lethality. So there's kind of these two phases of our immune system that's dependent on time. To make things even more complicated, Christoph Sherman is a leader in this. He has shown that our immune system, our immune cells are migrating um, at different times of day, such as when the animal is in the rest phase, many of the immune cells are actually in the peripheral blood. When we go then into transitioning into the active phase, though, these immune cells then are moving into the, into the tissues. So we now know that both the innate and the adaptive immune system, all of these cells have clocks. But I suppose you're asking, well, what's the molecular mechanisms driving these circadian rhythms? And it's essentially this. This is a very simplified version, but all I want you to remember is we have positive and negative regulators. The positive regulators are BMAL1 and CLOCK, and they're transcription factors. And they drive transcription of um, period and cryptochrome. And they then negatively regulate clock and BMAL and the cycle starts again. What I really just want you to remember is though that BMAL1 is the master regulator. Without BMAL1, you have no molecular clock. You see none of these circadian variations which I've just spoken about. Now what really interests us as a lab is that a lot of the chronobiologists were looking at metabolism in terms of like liver metabolism and metabolism um, in the muscle and really making some strong connections as to how the clock was regulating many different of these aspects of metabolism. And of course, given you know, the real um, growth now in the last 10 years of immunometabolism, we really started to try to think about putting all these three, three things together. What is the connection between circadian biology, immune function, and metabolism, which we call circadian immune and metabolism? And we've written a couple of reviews on this in the last couple of years. So I'm going to talk to you now about these studies in circadian immune and metabolism. And I'm going to talk about two specific stories. So one story is in relation to BMAL1, that master clock uh, transcription factor, which I, which I mentioned, and its effect on the inflammatory response in macrophages. And the second story then is on BMAL1. You can see I've, I've got an unhealthy obsession with BMAL1 and its, un, and its control of mitochondria and dendritic cell function. So the system that we use is we use a myeloid specific knockout of BMAL1. And whenever I mention knockout now from, from the rest of this talk, I'm just, really, I'm just referring to BMAL1 knockouts. So what we have in these animals is the myeloid lineage will, in the Y type situation will have nice circadian rhythms, but then those then which lack BMAL1 will lack these circadian um, rhythms. And a paper by a AJ Shala um, back in 2013 had shown using these mice, that these mice are highly susceptible to bacterial infection and, um, and LPS lethality. So what um, AJ showed is that if you don't have BMAL1 in the myeloid lineage um, and you infect the animals with listeria, they succumb to listeria much uh, greater than uh, your wild type counterparts. What interested us though from a metabolism point of view is that these animals get fat. So if you don't have BMAL1 in the myeloid lineage, these animals have an increase in, in body weight and a high fat diet but also as well that these animals are um, insulin um, insensitive. And again, that just got us really thinking about what's this connection between circadian rhythms, immunity and metabolism. We ourselves then went on to look at um, these mice in terms of LPS lethality. And what we showed, and actually this was shown back in the 1960s, is that when you take an animal and you inject it with um, lipopolysaccharide or LPS, that if you inject the animal at dawn, they have a much greater chance to, to survive than if you inject them at dusk. And um, what we showed and added to that was that if you didn't have BMAL1 in the myeloid lineage, these animals were much more susceptible to LPS lethality, um, irrespective of time of day. 
And then Jamie Early, who uh, was a PhD at, at that time um, in my lab, he started thinking about IL-1 beta. And the reason we thought about IL-1 beta is just because IL-1 beta is so involved in so many of these chronic inflammatory diseases, um, which we see to be affected with circadian disruption. And um, it wasn't lost on us that Jamie, who's a circadian biologist, has a surname called Early. We thought that was great crack. Um, but Jamie, what Jamie showed was that IL-1 beta induction by LPS had a time of day difference, such that um, if you injected the animals with LPS at, at dusk, they had much higher levels of IL-1 beta than if you injected them at dawn, showing this time of day difference. Jamie also went on to show that ROS levels correlated with that. So at dusk, you know, as the animals are going into their active period, they were um, producing greater levels of ROS. And then Jamie also showed that at dawn, which is the time when we saw the lower levels here in the wild type, in our knockouts, uh, they were producing more IL-1 beta. All basically shown that there was this connection between um, time of day and BMAL-1 dependence on IL-1 beta and ROS. Jamie also showed as well that um, IL or ROS, as detected by cell rocks, was much more increased in BMAL knockout bone marrow drive macrophages, uh, both um, basally and in response to LPS. Um, in order to try to understand this and figure out what was going on, we did a screen with uh, Ramnick Xaver in the Broad Institute, and he screened over 58 transcription factors to try to see if we could see if there was any transcription factors different between our wild types and our knockouts. And uh, what Danny found was actually that NRF2, which is this master antioxidant gene, was uh, much lower in our BMAL1 knockouts than our wild types. And this would explain, this explained in part uh, the higher ROS that we saw. Jamie also saw though an increased level in HIF. And I suppose many of you are familiar with HIF as the hypoxia inducible factor, um, which seems to play you know, such a key role in um, immunometabolism. So we saw higher levels of HIF and we also saw higher levels of a HIF target called PHD3. So it was this increase in HIF that really kind of got us thinking about, you know, what was the connection there between clock control of HIF and maybe immunometabolism. And this uh, review from Sarah Corcoran in, in Luke O'Neill's lab really nicely shows, you know, how dominant HIF is in terms of, you know, controlling pro-inflammatory gene expression, but how it links into metabolism such that many of the metabolic enzymes, or glycolytic enzymes, are HIF-1-alpha targets. But at the same time, succinate, which is a paper that we had back in 2013, also can stabilize HIF. So this kind of was a question that George Timmons um, in my lab took on board. And George is now a fourth year and um, final year PhD student. And I think we all have, you know, that a huge amount of sympathy for PhD students who are trying to finish up this year um, with the lockdown. But George anyway decided to have a look at metabolism in these uh, BMAL knockout macrophages. And what he showed using this glycolytic rate assay, and the knockouts are in red, is they were much more glycolytic. Um, both basally and with LPS than the wild types. So George then was, you know, really um, interested in this and wanted to understand this further. So what he did was he tried to see if glucose uptake was actually different in these knockout macrophages. And indeed it was. Glucose uptake is higher in our knockout macrophages, both control and with LPS. And what George also found was GLUT1, GLUT1, which is one of the main glucose transporters of macrophages, its expression was much higher in the knockout macrophages than in the wild types. And this was a really lovely experiment which George did, where he changed the level of glucose in the media. And by doing that in a wild type macrophage, he was able to increase um, the induction of uh, HIF and IL-1 beta, but this happened even more so in a knockout. So the knockouts have higher levels of IL-1 beta even um, initially, but then if you increase the levels of glucose further, they really ramp up their HIF-1-alpha and IL-1 beta um, production, which I just thought was a really nice demonstration of how glucose um, is really modulating metabolism and inflammation in these macrophages. 
So George, as the astute PhD student that he is, you know, really started to try to understand what was going on here. And he got very excited when he came across this paper from uh, Cornelia Wyand uh, back in 2016, which really showed that the glycolytic enzyme PKN2, which is an enzyme in the glycolysis pathway, was very much involved in this inflammatory dysfunction that was seen in monocytes and macrophages from patients with coronary artery disease. And when George read the paper, he was really astonished because what he could really see was both the metabolic phenotype and the inflammatory pro profile that um, Cornelia had found in the CAD patients really looked very similar to what we were getting in the BMAL1 knockout macrophage. We were really interested in this as well because of the fact that uh, cardiovascular disease is highly circadian. You're much more likely to have a heart attack first thing in the morning. You're much more likely to have a heart attack first thing in the morning on a Monday morning. So beware for next week. And what George found was that PKM2 indeed was higher in, the, in our knockouts um, with LPS induction. He also showed, and what Cornelia showed was that this was through um, higher levels of phosphostat 3, that PKM2 in its dimeric form, which is able to go into the nucleus, is able to phosphorylate uh, stat 3. And George also showed this in our knockout macrophage, it's higher levels of phosphostat 3. But then I think the killer experiment that George did was he used a stat 3 inhibitor. And uh, this is what Cornelia also had used in their paper. And what he could show is that with the STAT3 inhibitor, you can completely repress the higher levels of IL-1 beta in a BMAL knockout macrophage um, versus control. So, so what we have here in this part of the story is that BMAL in macrophages, one of the ways in which it's controlling IL-1 beta is certainly through NRF2. And that was a lot of Jamie's uh, PNAS paper. But our unpublished studies now are showing that BMAL is affecting uh, ROS. And you know, we know in macrophages, the majority of ROS is coming from the mitochondria. And certainly NRF2 is probably playing a role in limiting ROS um, via B BMAL. But we also believe that BMAL is having a direct impact on the mitochondria, which in its absence is promoting ROS, which is leading then, we know that ROS stabilizes HIF, this then causes an increase in glucose uptake and metabolism because many of the glycolytic genes, including GLUT1, are um, HIF1 alpha uh, dependent. But then this is causing probably a, a cycle in which you know, higher glucose uptake and metabolism and just higher um, oxidative phosphorylation is driving more ROS, which is driving more HIF. And then the upshot of all this is higher PKM2, that glycolytic enzyme, higher phosphostat 3 and, and higher IL-1B. So that was the first story, and um, I hope you're still still with me. The second story that we have is um, a really interesting story where we moved to dendritic cell function. Um, and we were sort of motivated to look at dendritic cells by um, a result we got a couple of years ago in a paper which we published with Kingston Mills. So with Kingston, what we were looking at is we were looking at um, the role of BMAL1 in the myeloid lineage in terms of multiple sclerosis. And what we found is, and we were kind of completely thrown by this, is that we could actually see a time of day difference in the severity of multiple sclerosis, just termed by these mean clinical scores, depending on the time of day that we actually immunize the mice. So if we immunize the mice at midday, we saw much higher severity in the disease than if we immunized the mice at midnight. And I was really astounded by this because, you know, these immunizations are happening, you know, here at day zero, and you're not showing disease, um, you know, paralysis in the animals for up to eight days later. So we were really intrigued by this. And we were also intrigued by another study that came out showing that uh, the flu vaccine is dependent on time of day of administration. Now, there's been a number of studies, but some of them are ambiguous, ambigu um, ambiguous about um, the role of uh, the molecular clock in terms of vaccines. But in this study in humans, what they showed was that if individuals were vaccinated in the morning, they had a much greater antibody titer um, a number of weeks later than they, if they were immunized in the afternoon. You know, a very cheap way to improve vaccine efficiency is just maybe by changing time of day. 
So that brought us to the dendritic cells because dendritic cells, many of you know, they have exquisite ability to take up antigen from vaccines, for example, and um, to present it on their surface and, and then interact with T and B cells to cause proliferation of those cells. You know, and, that's, and, and, and in a nutshell, that's exactly how vaccines work. So we really were interested in looking at the clock in um, dendritic cells. Another reason why we were interested in this was data produced from uh, James O'Shearon in our lab is that we could see actually that even though the macrophages had really nice uh, circadian rhythms, and this is just a clock gene reporter that we can measure by deciphorase, the dendritic cells actually had much greater rhythms. So that really got us thinking about this role of the clock in dendritic cells. So the question that we asked is like, is the clock within dendritic, dendritic cells responsible for time of day responses to vaccinations or really just time of day responses in terms of dendritic cell uh, function? And if so, how? And this is work that's been conducted again, all unpublished uh, by Mariana Cervantes and Richie Carl, two postdocs in the lab. We used a in vitro model to look at circadian rhythms and time of day. So when you guys have all your cells, primary cells, transformed cells, just sitting in a dish, what you probably have is a very unsynchronized culture. Each cell is ticking away according to its own time of day, but they're not synchronized together. But what we can do is it, we can do a serum shock. We can add serum for two hours. And what that does is synchronizes um, wild type cells so that they're all ticking along uh, at the same time of day. And we can compare that to our BMAL1 knockouts. And again, we can see this really nicely with our clock gene reporter in dendritic cells that we get these really beautiful circadian rhythms um, in our cells under this model. So what we can do is we can essentially take cells at different times post the serum shock and we can equate that then to time of day. So, so this time will be dawn or subjective dawn and this time will equate to dusk. And what Mariana found was, uh, what Mariana found is that we could use DQ over, which is a compound that, uh, that essentially um, when it is processed, when it, breaks apart, when it is uh, processed and breaks apart, it causes fluorescence. And what we can see is that in wild type um, DCs, that at dawn, we have much greater levels of processing than at dusk. But in a knockout macrophage, it seems to have equivalent levels of processing irrespective of time of day. And here's just a quantification of that. Um, we also, with Diana uh, Moreira and Dave Finley's lab in, Tr in Trinity, we also showed that this time of day in antigen processing was evident in cells ex vivo, which was really important for us to see. And what we saw is that e the CDC1s and CDC2s also show a time of day difference in processing as well. So we were trying to think what's the connection here and what's going on. And, and some of the data that we had, and actually some of the data in the literature shows that antigen processing is very much dependent on the mitochondria. And this is work that Richie did. If you put oligomycin onto wild type um, dendritic cells, you can really inhibit the level of antigen processing, oligomycin being an ATP synthase inhibitor. And then Richie went on to show in co-cultures that this increase that you get when you co-culture uh, dendritic cells with T cells and the dendritic cells then are loaded with OVA and activated with um, LPS, I think in this case, and the T cells we use are, are OVA specific. What you can see is this increase in T cell uh, mediated cytokines or interferon gamma and IL-17, and that's completely diminished if you have oligomycin. So, and what helped us even more to try to make this connection is there was a number of publications that came out um, around 2016 showing that BMAL1 in uh, liver cells and actually in fibroblasts was controlling mitochondrial dynamics. I'll talk about that in a second. And we found that really, really um, intriguing especially because there was this absolutely beautiful paper from Erica Pierce that came out as well around the same time, showing that mitochondrial um, morphology, so fusion versus fission, really determined whether a T cell was an effector T cell or a, a memory T cell. So that's what really linked our circadian clock, our mitochondrial um, uh, immunity with mitochondrial dynamics. And just for those of you who don't know, mitochondrial mitochondria are highly, um, they, they're, they are high, highly um, interconnected organelles. We often think of them as like little peanuts that 
float around in the cytosol, but actually mitochondria can change their morphology such that they can fuse together and form these like branches, or they can separate and become like the little peanuts that we're used to um, within, within the cell. And depending on the morphology really depends on um, their uh, metabolism, such that when mitochondria are fused, they have one type of metabolism, but when they're fizzed, they've got another. So we asked the question then, was mitochondrial morphology and metabolism controlled by the molecular clock and dendritic cells? And indeed it is. So what Mariana showed was that um, cells at dawn, DC cells at dawn are in this highly fused state. This is their mitochondria and um, it's uh, imaged by um, mitotracker red. But then at dusk, they go into this fragmented state. But the knockouts, they're fragmented irrespective of time of day. And you can see that quantification again, lovely rhythms here in the wild types, flat line in the knockouts. And we could link this then with metabolism. Oxygen consumption was going the same way. ATP production was going the same way. And so was mitochondrial membrane potential. So then we asked, well, okay, if, if mitochondrial morphology is actually involved in antigen uh, processing, if we alter it, can we alter our antigen processing? And we were um, aided by the fact that there's a number of compounds which affect mitochondrial morphology. One of them is Medivy, which reduces DRP1. DRP1 is the main mitochondrial fission protein. So if you do that, what, you, what happens is the mitochondria go into um, a fused state. So what we did then is we looked to see the effect of Medivy at dawn and dusk uh, dendritic cells. And what we found is at dawn, we had high antigen processing. The, the mitochondria are already fused. Adding Medivy didn't do much. However, at dusk, look at this. They're in this fragmented state. You add Medivy, you can cause this mitochondrial fusion, and you can also increase antigen processing by DQ over. And then in the knockouts, they're looking like a dusk dendritic cell. Fragmented, add um, Medivy, drive um, antigen processing, both at dawn and at dusk. And then this is just the quantification of that. So we were scratching our heads and we were trying to think about what's the mechanism here. And we kind of fell upon uh, calcium because calcium, cytosolic calcium, is a key regulator of calcineurin. And all you have to really remember is calcineurin affects DRP such that it activates DRP. And as I said, DRP is the main mitochondrial fission protein. And if you activate DRP, the mitochondria go into fission. So we wondered whether, and this was a wild idea, we wondered whether the clock was actually controlling calcium levels, right? Which would in turn affect calcineurin. And lo and behold, that's what we found. When we have a dawn dendritic cell, there's lots more um, mitochondrial, or sorry, calcium in the mitochondria. But at dusk, um, when they're in the fizz state, there, there's lots more cytosolic calcium. But in the BMAL knockouts, their, their calcium is remaining in the cytosol at both times of day, and it's not cycling. So then we ask, well, what happens if we inhibit calcineurin? So we can inhibit calcineurin with FK506. And what, calcineurin, what FK506 will do with, is it'll inhibit DRP. So it'll actually kind of act like Medivy if both of them are um, going through the same mechanism. And again, that's what we found. We found with FK506, we could actually increase the level of antigen processing in our dusk dendritic cells. And in our knockouts, we could increase the level of antigen processing in the dawn and dusk. Then we ask, well, what's going on here then? How is the clock controlling um, this, the location of calcium between the cytosol and the mitochondria? And there's the, uh, it was only back in 2011 that this mitochondrial calcium uniporter was identified. And it is a complex that um, allows calcium to go um, in through the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this is very preliminary work. And, but what we can see um, is that many of the subunits of this MCU, this mitochondrial calcium uni uniporter, are cycling. And of, course, oops, and of course, I know you're asking yourself, well, what happens or is there any inhibitors of the MCU? And indeed there is. And Richie has already done that experiment. But unfortunately, with the lockdown, um, his uh, ELISA plates are, are sitting um, in the freezer. So we have yet to know whether we can affect 
antigen processing and T-cell activation by using this uh, mitochondrial calcium uniporter. So in essence, what this story has really told us is that BMAL1 is, we think, and this is preliminary for sure, is potentially having an effect on this uh, mitochondrial calcium uniporter. This then would, whoops, sorry, this then, oh, this then would affect uh, cytosolic calcium. So if you bring calcium into the mitochondria, cytosolic calcium will go down. This then will inhibit the activity in calcineurin, and this will cause a uh, mitochondrial fusion. And there's probably some sort of feedback loop going on here because more fusion will um, essentially mop up more cytosolic calcium. But the upshot of all this is an um, increased antigen processing. So what we see essentially is at dawn, we have mitochondria in a fused state in dendritic cells, lots of mitochondrial calcium and increased antigen processing. But at dusk or in a knockout of BMAL1, we see a fizzed morphology for the mitochondria and more calcium in the cytosol and less antigen processing. So what we think are, you know, are the main findings from, the, from this study is that clock control of antigen processing. The fact that it seems to be such a strong regulator, is this one of the contributors as to why we see dysfunctional immunity when we observe circadian rhythm dis disruption? So, you know, when we think of circadian rhythm disruption in humans, you know, the most overt examples are in shift workers. And, you know, they are very susceptible to a range of chronic inflammatory diseases. And is this impact of BMAL1 in dendritic cells maybe a consequence of that as well? And then the second question that we now have, and we're on the edge of our seats, you know, and dying to get back into the lab to answer, really is can we harness these clock control mechanisms to, um, of antigen processing and, and maybe other aspects of DC functionality to enhance vaccine responses? And I would say, you know, what we're doing is, you know, trying to understand lots of new mechanisms of which the clock um, controls immunity. But it's also worth knowing that there's many drugs out there that are targeting um, circadian genes. So over half of the top 100 selling drugs target a product of a clock gene. That's really remarkable because only a handful of them are used, you know, in a time of day basis, which we call chronotherapy. So I think there's great value at maybe looking at some of these drugs as well that are already licensed to see if we can improve, improve their efficacy or reduce the toxicity by administering them at a certain time of day. And an example of this is uh, COX-1. So COX-1 is a really strong circadian profile in many tissues and COX-1 is the target for aspirin. We already know that aspirin has, is more efficacious um, if it is given in the nighttime than in the morning. So this is my uh, last slide. You know, if you remember absolutely nothing else from my talk, I'd just like you to maybe come away with this, is that when we think about biology and when it comes to biology, you know, start thinking about the what is, or sorry, not, don't just think about the what, but also think about the when. You know, when certain things are happening. From, you know, our work and, and many other groups around the world, we can see that our immune system is just massively circadian. Um, and, you know, that, you know, all, all, always raises the questions about the time when we're doing our animal experiments. We always seem to do them in the morning when the animals are asleep. Um, and so it's just to have that awareness about maybe the pathways that you're looking at are clock controlled. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the people who really done the hard graft for all this. And, you know, I'd have to say that I really work with some fantastic people and it's an absolute joy to work with them. And that's one of the things I really miss in the lockdown is actually interacting with all the individuals in my lab. And, you know, I've mentioned most of them, Marianne and Richie did the majority of the um, DC work. And then George and Jamie then did the majority of the... Um, our macrophage work and then Shannon, James and Lauren, they're um, PhD students in their second year who are really beginning to make their own mark as well. And then, of course, you know, science is a team sport um, and, you know, we would be nowhere without, you know, all the collaborators that we have. And we have some fantastic collaborators, many of which are in Trinity College, which is only down the road from RCSI. And, 
So we worked with Kingston Mills, David Finley's lab, Luke O'Neill lab is where I trained and Michael Monaghan's lab as well. And then a number of collaborators, both, you know, internationally and within RCSI. And then I just finally like to um, acknowledge our funding partners. So with that, I would just like to say uh, thanks very much. Um, oops, sorry. I would just like to say thank you very much. This is Ireland by not our Dublin by night and Dublin by day. And um, I thank for your attention. And I think Jan is going to give me some questions. Is that right, Jan? Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Annie. There was a lot of uh, questions uh, being asked during your talk. So I think people liked it uh, as much as I did. This time aspect is very intriguing. So thanks for this nice presentation. Thank very you, Jan. Nice. So let's start more or less in the beginning. Uh, there are some, some questions that are somehow related uh, um, regarding the TCA cycle and, and mitochondrial function. So the question would be whether there is a higher TCA cycle activity in the BML1 knockout um, uh, macrophages and whether that also relates to, to changes in OXFOS activity. Yeah, so that's the, that, that's a great question. And just in the sake of time, I actually didn't show this data, but George has also done, you know, a lot of profiling on oxygen consumption and the electron transport chain. And as you said, and as you suggested, what we do see is we see higher OXFOS um, and higher TCA activity um, in the BMAL1 knockout. So, you know, they're just, we just kind of think of them like they're just super, super metabolically active. Um, and we did some carbon tracing. This was done with um, Nick over in Cardiff and Emma in, in Swansea that we also see when we do the carbon labeling as well. Yeah, we see you know, a lot of flux um, through glycolysis and the TCA cycle, much greater flux than we see um, in the wild types. And do you have an idea whether that is then driving also the inflammation? Is there a role for this? Uh, how do you call it? Hypermetabolism in, in driving the inflammatory responses there? Yeah. So from from that paper, that the JX Med paper, you know, they they certainly saw higher oxfos as well in their um, monocytes from coronary artery disease patients, and you know, the higher TCA and oxfos will translate to higher ROS production as well. And you know, so that's what we think is probably the mediator here in the BMAL1 knockouts. And um, that the, the ROS is from the mitochondria and it's just due to higher um, TCA and, and OXFOS. I should also mention, you know, we also see specific differences, you know, in the electron transport chain as well in these BMAL1 knockouts. So we do think there's a lot going on, but we can really um, inhibit this higher inflammation that we see in the BMAL, um, BMAL1 knockouts when we use, when we inhibit ROS and we, when we use like mitochondrial ROS inhibitors as well. So we do think the ROS is, a, is probably one of the big effects. Right, right. And then there was an interesting question on, on the macrophages again. So with regards to glucose and what the question would be whether the, the loop gets closed and that in the end the high glucose would again drive B, BMAL to then switch off the system and, and L1 beta and RF2 and, and, and so on. So would, yeah, that, would that finish the loop? Yeah, that's actually a good question. We we haven't we haven't looked at that, I don't think, in depth. I think even when I don't think we see glucose though affecting BMAL1 expression. Um, I'm just thinking about George's experiments where he, he did that increase in concentration of glucose. And I didn't, I don't think he did see an effect on BMAL. So I don't, I don't know what would, like in, in these cells are either, you know, wild type or BMAL1 knockout. Okay. If we think about time of day, there's a negative component that's coming in, you know, to kind of close the loop at the end of the day per se. And that's mediated by cry and purr. I think what we'd have to do is look at the metabolism in those guys and, and see what's going on there. The BMAL1 knockout um, macrophages, you know, it's a really, it's a very strong um, model of circadian disruption because you've completely knocked out all circadian rhythms. You know, I think what would be nice as well is to do more kind of subtle models of circadian disruption and see what's happening there with the metabolism. I think that might give us maybe more, more mm -hmm. information, Jan. 
re related to that, I was also thinking, what, what are other models that you could use uh, in addition to BML1 knockouts? Because in the end, that's, I mean, artificial, but like more subtle things. What is out there? What, what did people do? Um, yeah, so what, a great model, and I just think this is gas that we can do, you know, we do this in mice as well. There's a shift work model. Right. So we can do a shift work model in mice. And basically what we're doing is we're just manipulating the lark, light, dark cycle. And what we can see when we do that, we haven't done those studies, but other folks have. And what we can see is when you do that shift work model in mice, they very much recap recapitulate what we see in humans as a higher pro-inflammatory state. So yeah, that would be a great model, you know, to have a more, a more physiologically relevant model of, circadian disruption that that's really relevant for today's population up to 20 percent of the population are shift workers yes absolutely and actually now that you raise this point there is a question on on, on night shift workers um the question is whether bmel mediated mitochondrial remodeling is related to cancer in these uh, night shift workers yeah that's a that's a great question and um, there's been a couple of papers out which show that uh, BMAL1 is protective actually in, in cancer. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there is probably a really strong link there. But to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if anyone's really mechanistically interrogated that. It's a lot of, there's a lot of epidemiology studies and a couple of mouse studies um, linking the two, but I don't think it's been interrogated completely, but it would make sense. Yeah, sure, I, yeah, I agree. But indeed, I, I assume, yeah. I imagine it's very difficult to really pinpoint toward that particular mechanism in, in those cases. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, I think between the, the knockout models that we have and like the shift work models and cancer models, you know, that's definitely possible. Yeah. Um, Maria Fernanda said that was absolutely an amazing talk. So that's nice to hear always. And Thank you. Was, that might be my mother. <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh, really? No. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then she comes, she asks whether BMEL um, could impact the mitochondria ER context and whether that could modulate uh, calcium uptake and uh, uh, antigen processing in, in uh, disease. That's a great question. That's an absolutely great question. We're intrigued by that ourselves and we're thinking about, we need to get some funding to look at this because what's really interesting is the ER is really important in terms of calcium going into the mitochondria, but as well as that, the ER is basically the endoplasmic reticulum, basically wraps around the mitochondria and causes it to fragment. So there's this really strong connection between the ER, mitochondrial morphology and calcium. And I'd love, you know, if, if, if Anya or Mariana there has any ideas about how we could model this. I, I, this is something that we'd love to do. Nice, nice to, to, to get this feedback. Um, another question relates to, uh, obviously time is a kind of environmental factor. Uh, one question asks what other uh, environmental factors can, can influence mitochondrial dynamics in immune cells, uh, just like time. But one of the examples uh, proposed was exercise, uh, maybe. Can you comment on this? Is, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too aware of any literature linking exercise, but there probably is, especially for muscle. But I do like aging is, uh, has a massive impact on mitochondrial morphology. And, and Richie in my lab is always talking about the fact that as we age, you know, my, the, the, the mitochondria become dysfunctional. And we think they're probably going into a more fragmented state they've probably lost, like the reason why we think there's this um, time of day difference in fusion and fission is actually probably a quality control check. Um, because what's happening is you need to get rid of your defective mitochondria probably every day. And that's why the clock is changing the morphology to, to fission. Probably one of the reasons is to allow mitophagy to happen and to take away those uh, defective mitochondria. So I know in terms of, well, environment, um, if that is really environment aging, but aging certainly has a big impact on morphology. And we're really interested in, in wondering, is that some of the link about why 
um, older individuals, it's, it's hard to induce robust vaccine responses in older individuals. You know, is this true defects in the mitochondria? Um, there's, re there's really a lot of questions coming up, sorry. <laughs> we, have to, we have to select, but they're all quite interesting. So it's, it's pretty difficult to select. Um, but I'm going to get all the questions, Jan, am I? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the questions. That I don't answer. Um, uh, again, great talk. Thanks. Um, from, from a newbie in both circadian rhythm and metabolism. So he it, it says it's a naive question, but I think it's a good question. Um, do you think the myelin cell intrinsic rhythmicity is being also entrained in vivo by central clock derived cues like hormones um, or also via nutrition? So I think th those questions also make a lot of sense. Um, so I think it would be nice to get your, your view on this. Yeah, that's a cracking question. And, and I think that's exactly what's happening. You know, in our cell system, it's a very simplistic system. All we're looking at there is the cell intrinsic clock. But as the individual said, when we go into the body, those cells are being influenced by a, by a myriad of other factors, you know, hormonal factors, feeding, fasting rhythms, all of that. And actually, we think we can even see a slight difference in the timing of the antigen processing from our in vitro model to when we go in vivo. And that's probably due to these modulating effects um, from, from like systemic effects. Feeding fasting, that, that's one of the things that really kind of, you know, got us really thinking about this connection between sort of circadian rhythms and metabolism because, you know, your clock controls when you feed and when you fast. And, you know, we know that we um, burn glucose during the daylight, during our active period, we, we burn fats during the nighttime. What does that mean for the macrophage? We don't know yet, but, but chances are this has a really big impact as well. Like Dave Finley in Trinity is looking a lot about, you know, nutrients and nutrient availability, but that will potentially change the time of day as well, which may have an impact. But that's a, it's a really great, great question. And they're the things that sort of brought us into the field in the first place. Yeah, very nice. And now that you're also explaining, during our your talk, I was also wondering about these modern life changes. And obviously there's also a lot to do about this intermittent fasting. Yeah. Do you think it can be a kind of reset of your clock? It is, yeah. That's one of the reasons why it's actually beneficial. So the intermittent, like I I'm talking about the fact that you know most of us should be actually just feeding for maybe eight hours of the day and then fasting for 16 hours. And this is work that's been done by Sachin Panda, who's you know just a world-class chronobiologist. And basically what that does is it strengthens your, your biological clock, it strengthens your rhythms because it allows you, it gives you a break, you know, <laughs> between one time of feeding and then allows you to go into that fat burning mode when you're not feeding. Most of us, Jan, by, by interest, most of us feed for about 16 hours of the day. We are grazing throughout the day. And I'd imagine with, with this lockdown, we are grazing even more. I, uh, I understand what you're saying. And I think, uh... <laughs> Most people do. I think many of us do. Yeah. I mean, this, this intermittent fasting, does it, do you know whether it impacts on, on, the, on the clocks of the immune cells also? I mean, so no one has, yeah, no one has looked at that um, specifically, but I bet you it does. Yeah. And it'll strengthen the rhythmicity, you know, in your macrophages and your dendritic cells, which, which will be protective. Right. Yeah. That's also what I, what, what I would assume. Um, I think maybe a, a last small question to finalize. It, it's, a, it's a quite specific one, but it is known that BML1 regulates neutrophil phenotype and function. Do you maybe know whether that is also related to metabolic changes? Is that known? So, yes, yeah, so BML1 does have an impact on, on neutrophils for sure. And uh, there's been some, some really nice work done in this. Neutrophils don't last for 24 hours. So the, the effect for on BMAL1 is more a timer, you know, in terms of like young neutrophils versus the aged neutrophils and their migration back to the bone marrow. 
if the question is, has anyone looked at metabolism of that? I don't think anyone has. Okay. They've looked at it in terms of neutrophil migration and the a and aging within the neutrophil. Right. Yeah, I think that was the question indeed. So the question is that no, that hasn't been done. I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> but I could be wrong, Jan. <laughs> I have maybe a, a last more conceptual um, or philosophical question to, to finalize. Now, during your, your introduction, I was thinking, okay, if you, if you want to prevent this circadian rhythm disruption, with all these modern lifestyle things, what would be the first thing we need to fix? Is it working outside or should we prevent using iPhones in bed or should we go for intermittent fasting or... What would be the, the best fix the, you think? The first fix, I think, is our relationship with light. Um, because that's the ma main controller of our body class. And, you know, as I mentioned, we're all like rats at a hole, Jan. Like, we never get outside. We don't get outside enough at all. And, you know, the level of light that we receive outside, it can be like... 10 to 100 times greater than what we um, experience inside. So we just, we need to get out more. Yeah, that is the main thing. And we need to get out, especially in the morning, because it's that morning light that really anchors our own body clock with the external environment. And then all the other things you said, intermittent fasting, light at night, erratic feeding. These are all yeah, feeding patterns. These are all things that are really neg negatively um, impacting high fat diet causes dampening of our circadian rhythms so you know everything that's in the the um, health and well-being book that we think is good for our health a lot of a lot of what that is doing is actually um, improving our our body clock that's i think a, a nice one to conclude let's go let's go outside but in this period yeah. it's not, not allowed everywhere or at least not everywhere at, uh, in the same way, but I think that, that makes sense. Here the sun is still shining a bit, so I, I will go outside and, and enjoy that. Thanks a lot again, Annie, for your time and interesting uh, discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure the people also, also liked it. I will briefly share you, my yeah. screen um, and let you know that next week we'll have another uh, very interesting talk on uh, targeting immunometabolism in times of COVID-19 from uh, Jonathan Powell. Um, the week after, actually, there was a candidate that just stood up. It, it's uh, Andrew Zhang from uh, uh, Columbia University. Uh, they're looking into new regulators of macrophage efferocytosis. So that will be the one on uh, May 13th. And then we're a bit... Uh, um, um, questioning whether we should proceed with it in June. So if there is still people that would like to present or if you want your PI to present or if you know someone or you want someone uh, to present here, please let us know. We can contact them and we, we can uh, for sure continue with this in June uh, if you're all interested. So that, that's something um, you could, you could um, let us know in, in, on Twitter or via, via email. Uh, at least till the end of May, we have a very nice program. So I hope you will still join us um, next week. Um, so Annie, again, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed your talk and the discussion. Um, and I look forward to actually meet you in, in real life uh, somewhere in the future. Absolutely, so, and Thanks so much. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks for your attention. Thank you. Bye, all.